Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt on Podcast One. Peacock fuels your true crime obsession with exclusive new originals. John Wayne Gacy, Devil in Disguise. Clowns can get away with murder. And Epstein Shadow, Ghislaine Maxwell. She inherited Jeffrey Epstein's secrets. Plus the most bingeable crime series, Snapped. Sign up now at PeacockTV.com. The level of connection you feel in your home dramatically influences your experiences there. Get the tools to control that connection in your communities with the first multifamily platform that unifies management and resident experiences to create smart apartments. Talk to a RealPage consultant today to see how your properties can meet the future of multifamily with the smart building suite. This is Beyond a Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. It's just making it on mandate. Get it on. Welcome to the best 15 minutes or so in the universe. It's beyond a reasonable doubt with birthday boy, Mark Garagas. I'm, I'm here. Nobody I'd rather spend my virtual birthday with than you, Adam. It's me, the dogs, and you. I love it. Is uh, How's the COVID protocol going? Uh, I'm still under uh, strict orders to I. Isolate. So I'll tell you, I've never seen anything quite like this um, uh, Armenian wedding. You know, there was an Armenian wedding um, about a month ago or maybe six weeks ago on the east side of town. It just wiped out all the armos. This one in Greece, um, I think there's only three people who are 45 and under, vaxxed or unvaxxed, who didn't get it. None of the Greeks got it. Uh, and on top of that, it's now permeated the over 45 crowd. So it's just wild. So wait, is this the wedding you were at in Greece? In Greece, exactly. And so we've been trying to figure it out anecdotally. Was it going to the island of Paros, COVID Isle? Um, was it uh, staying out? You know, at first I was I was saying it sure seems to hit the 20 to 30 year old range. And does that mean because they were clubbing it all night in Athens or uh, going out in Paros or not? But, you know, the virus knows what the virus knows. And it pretty much has just wiped out everybody at this point. All right. So what's on your mind legally? So, I Interestingly, um, and I, we may, Gary and I may talk about this with Jimmy Neutron, but I want to get your take on one thing. There has been. Uh, a lawsuit, and you're old enough like me to remember when Al Davis used to sue the NFL. Mm-hmm. And this, the twist on this one is the city of St. Louis suing the NFL for the Rams leaving. Mm-hmm. There's been some, you know, without getting into the weeds, there's been requests for defaults or terminating sanctions because of litigation abuse and things of that nature. There is, it's setting up right now for potentially, they didn't get out of St. Louis. So can you imagine trying this case? Yeah, because, and the reason I think of you when I thought of this case is, you always define uh, political controversies in terms of just put yourself in, you're a Steelers fan or you're a Lions fan, right? Right. Here you've got a case where, The NFL let a franchise go from St. Louis. The case is going to be tried in St. Louis, um, and they're going to be arguing about the economic effects of taking that franchise out of St. Louis. Doesn't it have all the earmarks for a monstrous verdict? Yeah, sounds like some home cook. And yeah, the (laughs) St. Louis had the Cardinals for... God, must have, been, must have been 35 or 40 years. I don't know. Gary can look it up. The Cardinals were around in the 60s. I don't know if they were in the 50s. Who's their famous? This is a good test for you. Who was their famous quarterback? Jim Hart. Was, Jim Hart. Very good. Okay. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I didn't even let you get to quarterback. I didn't because, even get the question out yet, Jim Hart. Well, because all we got is Jim Hart and Conrad Dobler. Dobler, right. Who was the meanest man in the NFL. Um, I was saying the other day to Vinny that, um, at least on tweeting, that it's sad that not that many people got to fully experience, because he died young, Conrad Dobler, because he was something, wasn't he? Conrad Dobler may still be alive, but without the use of his knees. So Conrad Dobler is alive, age 71. 
Yeah. What well, don't I know well. about Conrad Dobler? Um, so he, uh, they were there from 60. It's funny. I was saying, are they making the 50s or the, just the mid 60s? So the 1960 to 87. Then I guess they went teamless for a bit. Maybe, maybe a bit. And then the Rams showed up. And then, of course, the Cardinals resurfaced in Arizona. But I don't think the Cardinals got to Arizona in 88. I think they may have been a defunct franchise for a number of years and then ended up in Arizona. I don't know how this math is working out. They relocated to Tempe, Arizona in 88. Oh really? So, yes. Really? But they may have had. They I may, never would have guessed that. It is unclear either. here from this article whether they took a season off in between or something. Uh, they probably didn't. Uh, so they've just been in Arizona that long. And yeah, I guess you go back. You think about Pat Tillman and guys like that, Jake the Snake Plumber, and guys like that. They were they were they were right. well established in Arizona before those guys got to the team. So I guess it's been a while. And then the Rams got there in 88? 95. Oh, that's what, now that's weird to me. So they. Oh, because the Rams went Orange County. Right. They went from Los Angeles to Anaheim. Right. And they still call them the Los Angeles Rams. And then they went to St. Louis and St. Louis is without a franchise then in that case. And, uh, there are other teams that sort of had that. Baltimore had that with the Colts, and then Baltimore the Colts moved it. And also, whatchamacallit, um, oh, the other, another Midwest team that I'm uh, having a, a brain lock on. But Stangles, one other story I wanted no? to talk about before mm-hmm. we run out of time. Gary and I just saw it right before we went on the air. Gary, you want to talk a little bit about this? Because it's quite a story that's breaking here in New York. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Actually, since you and I spoke, Mark, I realized that I have uh, some close family friends who live in the neighborhood of this gentleman's home. But Ace, I was telling you about this one before we started. Uh, the FBI has raided the office of a police sergeant's uh, union in, in mm-hmm. In New York, yeah, which they call SBA, and most people have thought when they read it that it was for a small business administration, but it's not. They've got a, I, I believe it's Sergeant's Benevolence Association. I believe that's correct. So they've raided that office and the office or the home rather of their the managing person of that organization. He is apparently uh, has a history of clashing with uh, the city government and De Blasio, and uh, has been has had some antics on Twitter. Let's just say. He, he's the guy you may remember, Adam, who, when de Blasio's daughter was arrested uh, during the um, uh, BLM protests, he's the guy who either posted or excerpted the, I believe, Gary, and correct me if I'm wrong, her police report, I believe, to, um, to try to upstage Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York. Well... You know, it's weird because if I'd heard this story a few years ago, I would say, oh, there's some sort of skull and bones thing going on here and we got some bad cops. But more recently, the DOJ and the FBI, they've all been essentially weaponized at this point. And now I'm not so sure. So you cross the Blasio. Well, while you're while you're going down this particular rabbit hole, he is a very prominent supporter of Donald Trump and very public about that. Right. So we're kind of living in a new world order where the Department of Justice and the FBI are getting quite selective with who who they prosecute and whose homes they raid, depending on who those people supported politically. And uh, that is a new world order and not a world that I particularly want to live in. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, the, as somebody who's um, beaten this dead horse, I can't tell you how many times, um, whether you go back to uh, Bill Clinton in Whitewater or you go to uh, uh, other famous, uh, uh, before that, you could go to the um, George uh, Herbert Walker Bush and uh, the scandals there. It, it's always... It's uh, there had we we and people were saying this 30, 40 years ago when I first started practicing that the you call it weaponization back then. They used to call it the criminalization of politics. And Mm -hmm. um, and it has become in stark contrast. um, And I think weaponization is probably a good way to put it. People are at least 
from my standpoint, as a somebody who's practiced criminal defense, I like the idea that people have a little skepticism um, and a little cynicism um, when something first happens, because that's what you're supposed to have. You're supposed to have kind of a presumption of innocence and a critical approach to when law enforcement uh, does one of these. You know, one of the things this guy is um, has a contingent in New York, is my understanding, who do not like him at all. Um, and so people were almost cheering online uh, when this was happening. But there was some theater to this also. There, this was kind of a Rudy Giuliani style uh, perp walk of the let's march out the boxes with our uh, law enforcement blazers on. And, and you know, kind of when you were railing about um, uh, well, she's been years now, the Roger Stone SWAT team takedown and uh, things of that nature. The theater of this, I think, uh, also has a uh, there should probably be a, a recalibration of as well. Well, I, I'd say the same about Lori Lachlan. <laughs> like, just turn yourself in. Tell the attorney, tell your client they need to turn themselves in by noon tomorrow. No reason for the SWAT team to show up at Lori Lachlan's house. No reason. And by the way, you want to get people shot, have a bunch of beaked up agents with with military gear and assault rifles bang on someone's door at 6 a.m. when it's dark outside. I mean, well, and by the way, you can also extend you're talking rightfully so about an arrest warrant where you presumably they've been dealing with the lawyer, the lawyer to tell the lawyer, the prosecutors have that this person is either a subject, a target or a witness. And, you know, depending on whether they cooperate, they can move up or move down. In that case, you're absolutely right. Call them up, say, turn yourself in. One of the reasons that I always suspect prosecutors don't want to do that is because then a defense lawyer is going to say to the judge, look, they made a call. They came right in. They knew they were getting arrested and they're not a flight risk. So it undercuts one of the main arguments the prosecutors already made, always made. In the case of. Oh, let's let's really examine that because it's a very smart point, which is I, as a lay person, keep saying, why are you showing up the, at these people's homes in pre-dawn hours and rousting them? And, you know, their dog's barking. The dog can get shot. You know, I mean, the wife comes it downstairs. Often does. Yes. Often I mean, does. it's insane. But you're right. If you say bring your client in, defense attorney, and, you know, r- remand him to the to the court, well, then you've completely cut your your flight risk off at the knees because obviously there's a prime example of that person not fleeing and now the DA can't make the flight risk argument. And and by the way, the arguments now at most hearings are danger to the community or a flight risk. So if you cut off flight risk and by the way in almost all of the large fraud cases, it's almost always flight risk. Remember the um, Tom Bur- uh, Barack, who was formerly of Colony Capital, when they arrested him, he had to sit in custody for, I don't know, five days a week. They had him marched out to the um, the Rancho Cucamonga, I think, holding facility. And it was all because of his massive wealth that he was a flight risk. Well, I guarantee you, if the U.S. Attorney's Office or the uh, the law enforcement had just called him up and said, "We're you know we're we're going to unseal the indictment tomorrow, get your ass down here and get in front of the duty judge," you think Tom Brock was going to hop a plane and go to Lebanon? Not a chance. So, in those cases, it's the only argument they've got. There's a case that I haven't briefed Gary or Mark (laughs) on, but it's an interesting case, which is, I think, a Marine commander who basically just said, uh, hey, uh, this this whole uh, this whole fiasco about um, well, now you make me think Lebanon, um, Afghanistan, Afghanistan. It was a shit show and people should be held accountable. He got a gag order. He kept talking and he's in the brig now 
and I he's in, and I don't know when he's getting out. I think he had some sort of hearing pending or something like that. He has been freed in the last hour or so. Oh, in the last hour. But uh, oh, there's a- I've been following that, and I've, I'm glad you brought that up because it it shows you that in certain contexts you do not have at all a First Amendment right to speak. Um, you there's, just don't. there's another case of a guy who was a former uh, naval. I don't know if he's a na- he wasn't an admiral, but he was he was up the up the pecking order a little bit in the navy. He attended January 6th. He never went into the Capitol, but he attended it with his wife. They showed up at his house, pulled him out of his house several days later and put him in solitary for 49 days. Again, that's kind of what we're talking about. This suspension of rights as as we know them it's getting into a little bit of a scary place there's a theme which is fuck with the government and all the rights are going out the window you know the it's interesting you say that because i brought a case decades ago for a police officer i he was my client who had written a somewhat fictionalized account of his department Um, And it was not flattering. And they fired him. And I remember making the argument at the time that how could you fire him for this? And, you know, the the courts at that point just stood on their head and said, no, that's okay, You can do that in, you know, and invoked security, invoked um, the usual immunities um, that they cloak whenever you don't want to grapple with what the hard issues are. and I remember at the time arguing this ha- this is a pernicious um, kind of a precedent to set because you can expand that those immunities exponentially whenever you want to just to kind of further, as you say, um, grind somebody into the ground, basically. And it's also also interesting that all the people that never stop applauding whistleblowers when it comes to a defense contractor or Halliburton or something like that, when a guy in the military essentially steps up and says, you guys fuck this Afghanistan withdrawal up 10 ways to Sunday and they fucking take him away and put him in the brig. The folks who applaud the whistleblowers don't have any thoughts about this guy. They have no, there's no more plotting going on. Yeah. And, and I'll take it one step further. Uh, I would venture to say that the same person who's got no problem with that guy being remanded into custody would be appalled by the reports that Mike Pompeo was planning on ways to assassinate Julian Assange. And so, you know, you can't. That's part of the problem with uh, the contemporary discourse. If you're going to be intellectually appalled by certain things. It can't always be when your ox is getting gored. Well, you can do this little thought experiment, which is what if Trump had been elected to a second term and Trump and Pompeo and company botched the whole Afghanistan withdrawal and then some Marines stood up and said, this is wrong. Trump screwed the pooch on this and they threw him in the brig. Do you think Rachel Maddow would have thoughts about that? I say she would. But she has no thoughts about this. And that's what we that's the theme that we kind of keep going back to, which is just be intellectually honest or at least consistent. All right, Mark, I'm going to let you go trip the light fantastic because I know on a regular weekday how much you enjoy dancing, but certainly when your birthday is upon oh, yeah. us how you love to celebrate. Thank so, you. Um, uh, oh, Hi, Hi, yeah, Gary. good seeing you. Uh, and happy birthday once again, my friend. All right. Uh, you can go uh, October 30th. I'm going to be at the Brea Improv with Rob Riggle. We're going to do, I'm going to do two shows. Rob's going to do one of them. Hopefully we'll have uh, another big name join us up there as well. We're working on some uh, good ones. So you can get tickets to that. You can also go to amcrawl.com for all the, live shows and you can check out our pluto tv channel chassis channel on pluto tv 687 subscribe to our youtube page youtube.com slash reasonable doubt podcast and 
Till next time, it's Adam Kroll for Mark Garagas. Say it. Mahala. Thanks for listening to Beyond a Reasonable Doubt. Stay tuned for more bonus episodes coming soon. I hate to break it to you, but you're in for a big surprise. Five years from now, Jane, who's resigning today, will ring the NASDAQ bell, officially launching her company on the public market. And what you'll soon realize is that Jane stole your most valuable data to start her new company on her way out the door. Learn how Code42 Insider can stop data theft and protect your organization's most valuable assets. Visit Code42.com to learn more.